White House in Washington, crowds gather for the inauguration of Franklin D. Roosevelt as President of the United States for a fourth term. Invitations admit 7,000 guests to the White House grounds. Among the guests are wounded servicemen from nearby military hospitals. Before the south portico of the White House, the crowd lines up. For the first time, an inauguration is held not at the Capitol building, but here in the president's own backyard. Portico steps, 13 grandchildren of the president watch the ceremony. At the bottom of the steps is Harry Hopkins, presidential advisor and aide. Government leaders arrive for the ceremonies. Secretary of War and Mrs. Stimson. Secretary of Navy and Mrs. Forrestal. Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes. Harlan Fisk Stone, Chief Justice of the United States. Admiral of the Fleet, Ernest King. Edward R. Stettinius, Secretary of State, and Mrs. Stettinius. General of the Armies, George C. Marshall, and Mrs. Marshall. Now, in a grim year of war, the shortest and simplest inaugural on record begins. Former Vice President Wallace swears in Harry Truman, new Vice President. President Roosevelt takes the oath of office. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. The president delivers a brief inaugural address. We Americans of today, together with our allies, are passing through a period of supreme test. It is a test of our courage, of our resolve, of our wisdom, of our essential democracy. If we meet that test successfully and honorably, we shall perform a service of historic importance, of historic importance which men and women and children will honor throughout all time. As I stand here today, having taken the solemn oath of office, in the presence of my fellow countrymen, in the presence of our God, I know that it is America's purpose that we shall not fail. In the days and the years that are to come, we shall work for a just and honorable peace, a durable peace, as today we work and fight for total victory in war. Lake Michigan, a Coast Guard demonstration of a new technique of rescue by helicopter, especially meant for aviators forced down at sea. The airman is taken aboard. The helicopter then proceeds to Chicago, where the rescued flyer is lowered to the ground. The flying machine, without ever coming down, has taken him from far out on the water to a destination on land. Liberator bombers from Moratai crack down on Puerto Princesa Airfield, Japanese base in the Philippines. 
Knockout blows such as this preceded each new step on the road to Luzon. Bombardiers dropped 500 heavy bombs on enemy installations on Palawan Island. Enemy airstrips are battered into uselessness. Unceasing support from land and carrier-based aircraft in the battle for the Philippines. and men against the elements. Through the frozen Great Lakes, the new United States Coast Guard icebreaker Mackinac cuts a vital path. Behind her, cargo vessels en route from Duluth to Chicago in the earliest midwinter crossing on record. The Mackinac grinds through 20 inches of solid ice at eight miles an hour. Urgently needed in the war effort, these newly built ships would normally be marooned on the Great Lakes for two more months. Now, they are delivered on time. Infantry landing craft in storm-tossed Atlantic seas on the way home from Sicily, Salerno, and Normandy. These are small ships, but seaworthy. Veterans of landing missions throughout Europe, they are still fit for new assignments in the Pacific. Typhoon off the Philippines. An American carrier plows through raging seas in a grim 48-hour fight with a savage tropical storm. Crewmen, battling winds which threaten to sweep them overboard, tie down planes which have broken loose on the carrier deck. Wind velocity reaches 75 miles an hour at the climax of this merciless storm. Some craft of this task force are lost, but the carrier is safe. Ships and men win a battle with weather. Burma, the road back, a tough and bloody road as Allied troops move in against the Japanese. Nearing strategic Bamo are troops of the Chinese 38th Division. They cross a river junction near the outskirts of Bamo. Chinese and American officers plot the attack as Chinese artillery opens up. fighting, the ring around Bamo is steadily tightened. Dive bombers pave the way, only a few hundred yards ahead of advancing infantry. <laughs> Japanese resistance in northern Burma begins to totter. Yard by yard, the Chinese push forward. Artillery and fighter bombers have devastated the city. The Japanese garrison has been annihilated. General Dan Sultan, United States commander in Burma and India, inspects the city. Over Bamo flies the Chinese flag. 